Okay, well, thanks, and good morning. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me, and of course, congratulate Harry and, and Ian for their uh, recognition and award uh, this weekend. Um, so the charge is, is defining uh, boundaries and, and uh, thresholds for active surveillance. And I would say that I, I left here, so 16 years ago, Susan, was when I, yeah, six, 16 years ago, 2001, I left 10 days before 9-11. Um, but for I think the past 15 years, we've been uh, stepping back. For the last 15 years, I think we've been trying to get people to accept active surveillance. And, and perhaps uh, I know Memorial was way ahead of the game, and, and so are we and others. But I think the past is, is put there, which is there was always this uh, understanding to try to avoid overtreatment of uh, clinically indolent disease. And again, I think that that's been conquered. Uh, the goals were to reduce morbidity and increase the acceptability of active surveillance. And again, I think that we spent the better part of the last decade getting to the point that it is acceptable. And there's a couple uh, pieces of data. This is from, from Peter Carroll's group and Capture, uh, looking at men with uh, low CAPRA scores, so that would be the low risk patient. And then the circles there are, are men choosing active surveillance, and clearly it's at least 40% or more. Uh, there's other evidence. This is a group from community practices in Michigan. And when one looks at those that are eligible candidates for active surveillance, it's variable but it's at least 50%. And, and again, I saw the, the data from Andrew this morning here at Memorial, it's quite a bit higher than that. And I know at our center, it's, it's most, mostly everybody that's eligible is started on active surveillance. I think we see that as the, the past. And now for the first time ever, if you look at the AUA guidelines, the ASTRO guidelines, you look at who should have active surveillance. In fact, it says it's the best available care option for very low risk, and it's the preferred care option for the low risk. So again, we've, we've made it there. We've established that it's this strategy that will avoid overtreatment. We've changed the paradigm, I think, now. What's the present now? The, the present now is which is what we've spoken uh, about this morning, which is just now a strategy to identify potentially virulent disease amongst the background of apparently indolent. Because we do know that there are those that look apparently uh, uh, indolent but have some uh, degree of virulence there. So we want to refine su surveillance protocols and now avoid undertreatment. I think that's where we're going. So for the today, uh, again, I've been charged to talk about boundaries and thresholds. Who to, who to do this on, maybe how to monitor, how to do the triggers, and I'll end with some future directions which uh, we're pursuing on, on, on a, mo mostly on a multi-institutional uh, study that we have. So these are the standard entry criteria. I think that you've seen these before. These are the, the, the four uh, major cohorts, and I'll just say for, I know Dr. Hamdi's here for, for his benefit. This is the North American experience. The PREA study and others are not included on this. But when one looks at this slide, and the point of this is not to go through every detail, but to show that the entry criteria are variable. There's no doubt that some include issues with stage or PSA. Uh, most have a, have a, a consistent Gleason. Uh, the Canary Pass cohort is a unique cohort that basically is taking anyone that's choosing active surveillance and understanding the natural history and studying the disease uh, from a, a, a more agnostic standpoint. There are those that include biopsy information and even those that include measures of, of prostate volume or PSA density. What do ASCO and the NCCN say? You can read it there yourself. Basically, any low risk for ASCO with maybe a little low proportion pattern four. They do state this over age 75, which is a unique aspect that they have. The NCCN is, again, any, any very low or low risk and maybe some favorable intermediate risk, which we'll get into a bit later. How do they follow? How do we follow these patients and how do, how do uh, the major cohorts? And again, this is uh, um, the cohorts all numbering over 1,000 patients. And in general, the same. Uh, somewhat of a PSA every three to six months. And then the, the differences over here is perhaps how often we, we biopsy men. Uh, the Hopkins cohort has been pr pretty strict with every year. Maybe every 24 months they're changing for the very low risk. Uh, the outlier might be the Toronto group, which is every three to four years. And I think that's instructive uh, for later in this talk, uh, understanding that they actually ascertain the endpoint of upgrading uh, less frequently than the other groups do. What do the other guidelines say? Well, ASCO says uh, get PSAs every three to six months and maybe once a year DREs. Interestingly, a biopsy at the six to 12 month mark here, and then uh, biopsies every two to five years. So it's a very wide open window. The NCCN sort of hedges and says no more often than every six months for PSAs and no more often than every 12 months uh, for biopsies, which makes, makes good, good sense. With regards to boundaries, I think this question has been raised already many times this morning. I think we're all reading the same papers. Should intermediate risk prostate cancer be eligible for active surveillance? And I think there are many studies that have looked at this. This is uh, the first one. This is from, from Peter Carroll's group at UCSF, looking at about 100 men 
who uh, were intermediate risk, uh, and this has been updated, but this is the one that's been published uh, with, with a follow-up, and these were based on a, a, a CAPRA score, again, zero to two versus three to five. And when one looks at here, there is no difference between the patients in terms of active treatment, upgrading, uh, or PT3 rates, although there is a suggestion here, a trend perhaps, that uh, men that have intermediate risk disease on entry to active surveillance have about a 50% uh, PT3 rate at the time of surgery. Uh, the Europeans have looked at this, and now this is well over 100 men, uh, and again, when one looks at it, they did show that there was more men if they started at intermediate risk that did have active treatment eventually. Uh, there, was no, there was a difference in overall death, but no difference in prostate cancer deaths. Uh, notably, there was a significant uh, difference in metastatic disease, again, if the patient came in uh, with an intermediate risk disease. The Toronto series, of course, have, have, have really addressed this uh, quite nicely. This is their first report. This is a few years ago, uh, just showing out of, out of almost 1,000 patients, 15 deaths and 13 uh, patients with metastatic disease. It was disproportionate number had uh, Gleason 3 plus 4 at the diagnosis compared to the overall cohort. And then almost all men who either died or had metastatic disease did have Gleason 7 at some point in time. Uh, during, during the course of their, uh, their, their active surveillance. And Gleason 6, a score more than Gleason 6 was, was associated with the worst survival. They really honed down and kind of unpacked this in this analysis. This was just published in Journal Neurology. Now this is over 200 intermediate risk patients that have gone on to active surveillance. Uh, and again, when one looks at treatment-free survival, uh, uh, intermediate risk had, had more treatments. And when one looks at METS-free survival, again, about a hazard ratio of threefold more for metastatic disease. And you can see here, uh, once a, a man reaches a three plus four, they had much more metastatic uh, disease. And they really ended with a uh, quite strong quote saying, we believe active surveillance cannot be advocated for Gleason 7 prostate cancer outside of a research protocol. Now, I could step back and say that, remember, they didn't have as many biopsies. The follow-up protocol was quite a bit different. Uh, can we really take this into account with the, the other ways that we have been following active surveillance? I, I think that's a question that we, we should ask ourselves. The NCCN guidelines come down like this. Again, intermediate risk, this big bin of seven, which uh, Samson Fine talked about as being a very heterogeneous group, certainly. And, and they say, certainly, there are some men with favorable risk, and that would be predominant pattern three, less than 50% uh, positive cores, and only one uh, intermediate risk factor. ASCO has come down, again, and said low, low volume pattern four with age over 75. Again, I think the data that support that are rather low, but that, that this is the guideline that came out for um, intermediate risk disease. Again, I think we've heard here many times this issue of quantitative Gleason pattern, and I won't go through all the data. I mean, this is one, again, this is from, from Peter Carroll and Matt Cooperberg's data um, looking at quantitative Gleason. Adam Reese did this when he was a fellow there, um, as well as many other uh, uh, notable uh, uh, a manuscript that really investigated that there is a favorable risk. And Jesse McKinney and our group with the Canary Group has looked at uh, over 1,200 patients, again, looking at individual architectural patterns. And I won't go into this I, I, for sakes of time with regards to the cribriform and actual particular Gleason pattern fours that might be more virulent than others. So switching gears to thresholds, uh, these are the classic thresholds that we use and everybody uses for uh, saying go off active surveillance. So that might be something about the biopsy, an increased grade, something about the PSA, or maybe about stage. And what are the major groups looked at? So again, not, not to go through the whole slide, but this is the major groups, and these are their definitions of reclassification. So some have a PSA definition, others don't. Almost everybody has this sort of any increase in Gleason grade. And then some have a biopsy criteria, and, and again, other, others don't. And I think that all these definitions clearly have issues. Uh, there are multiple PSA uh, studies that are conflicting. There's inter-observer variability of grade. And then now with this new era of MRI, how does one really ascertain uh, a biopsy that's done by MRI that might have a large proportion of cancer versus uh, those that are not done by a uh, MRI technique? This is courtesy of Bruce Trock. He, he, he gave a talk at, at the Fred Hutch Cancer Center recently in Seattle and gave me uh, a few slides. And, and so he looked at all the, the, the high, high quality papers of PSA velocity, PSA doubling time. There were as many positive as negative studies and with multiple limitations, whether that be selection or inadequate analyses, uh, no central review of Gleason and so forth. I think that at this point in time, at least in, in this review, uh, PSA does not seem to have uh, very robust support for being a trigger for intervention.
pathology, this is our group. We gave, uh, this is for Jesse McKinney, he, he's done a wonderful job and he's our central pathologist for the Canary cohort and just did a simple simple study, took, took 100 consecutive patients, sent them to GU pathologists and for the classic Gleason patterns, that would be the classic three plus threes, larger volume, um, the kappa was pretty good. Uh, the concordance was very good. But for these small foci, it was 0.27. I mean, there were pa pa pathologists, GU pathologists, calling Gleason 6, calling Gleason 7, causing Gle Gleason 8 um, at, at a very high rate, and it was, it was very alarming. And this occurred in one of four. You know, 25 percent of all, uh, of all biopsies on active surveillance had these little small foci uh, that would cause these, these issues with inter-observer uh, uh, variability. So how about, how about the studies and how they've been? Again, very busy slide. I'm just going to focus on a couple points. And these were, these were made before by, by Peter and others on the panel. But when one looks at progression-free rates, first of all, you see progression-free rates are very variable. Uh, there's, there's no doubt that there are some that, that might have a 40 percent progression-free or 40 percent reclassification-free at five years uh, or up to 76 percent in, in the Toronto. The, the Hopkins series uh, at 65 percent and the Canary series at 65 percent are pre pretty similar with regards to progression-free, but we'll see that why is that. It's who's getting into active surveillance and how uh, they're being followed. What was brought up earlier and I think is underappreciated is this idea of PSA density uh, or some measure of volume. We choose prostate volume, others choose PSA density uh, as, as a predictor for reclassification as well as number of cores, which is something about volume. I won't get in that last column for sakes of time. But at the end of the day, how, how have these, how, what, is, what has come about? How about the cancer-specific outcomes? Uh, Toronto, as I said, we know this, there have there been, of the 993 that they reported, there have been 15 deaths and 13 alive with metastasis. Interestingly, there have been 223 that were treated in this report and one in four had a recurrence after treatment. And that's only 6% of the total cohort, but that's one in four of those that have been treated. You can juxtapose this to the Hopkins cohort where they have about the same number but about over double the number of treatments. So 470 treated patients and in their series is only 1 in 10 or 1 in 12 that are having a recurrent disease. And again, this is very likely due to the inclusion and exclusion and I'll show our studies of modeling in this area, only two prostate cancer deaths. The Canary cohort had a, a much fewer uh, number, a lower number of, of treated patients, only 170, but 1 in 3 had adverse pathology. So that's one in three patients having surgery, uh, and that would be either primary pattern four or PT3 disease or greater. And there was really no relation to initial risk. So these were very low risk at entry or low risk at entry still had about one in three chance. So how can we refine these thresholds? And, and I think that many of uh, us have, and these are just an example of some of the ways that we try to refine these thresholds. There's certainly modeling efforts. You know, Andrew Vickers here and others at Memorial have been at, uh, working with us in this. There's been advanced imaging, which we heard about earlier today. And then there's a huge list of biomarkers, which I'll only give one example that we've looked at. So this is a, a, a work from primarily Ruth Etzioni. We have an R01 grant looking at prostate modeling of, uh, to identify surveillance strategies. And we, we actually acquired all the major cohort data and had about 2,500 patients. We tried to level the playing field. So we said, let's take only Gleason 6 disease, only T2, only PSA less than 10. And we also tried to level the protocols of follow-up. So we understood, we, we, we took a, a joint statistical model that took into account these variable surveillance intervals and competing treatments, and this has been recently accepted to annals. And then we looked at the patient consequences with either more intensive or la less intensive. And here's just a snapshot of one, one figure. This is the biopsy upgrading, again, trying to level the playing field with regards to who gets in and how they're followed. The one bit of information we did not have was volume on all these patients. But when one looks at here over time in biopsy upgrading, this is Johns Hopkins group, this is simply upgrading. This is not volume uh, increase. Over 10 years, the, 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 the rate of upgrading in the Johns Hopkins cohort is about 35 percent. But when one looks at here, the past in the Toronto and certainly UCSF is almost double that for upgrading. What's interesting is if one looks at treatment, it's flipped the opposite way. And again, kind of leveling the playing field here, the Johns Hopkins group is uh, over time is 40 percent treatment as opposed to uh, the past UCSF and Toronto are more clustered down below. And again, I think this is due to the definitions of progression. Even when we try to level that, there's something inherent about these patient populations that are causing these differences. So the summary on, on, on some of our modeling efforts, there's no doubt that progression treatment rates cancer-specific outcomes are highly associated with, with, with inclusion and who gets in as well as how they're followed, although there are still inherent risks of upgrading that are specific to the populations that we're not quite capturing. My tendency is to feel that it's probably due to volume 
and who's getting in with regards to PSA density, but again, we can get into that later. Also, we found interesting that, that if one does a biennial biopsy, so every other year biopsy, instead of every year, of course, after a confirmatory biopsy, you'll reduce the number of biopsies by about a third, and you'll only delay the detection of an upgrading by about three to five months. So again, this is accepted in annals. It should be, be published shortly. I think Dr. Vargas gave a very uh, refreshing talk. I, I only have two slides on MRI. I think MRI is the future in, in many ways. We have to understand it more, standardize it, of course. Inner observer variability is a significant issue. He, he showed this earlier. This is actually the memorial data here. Uh, experienced readers look, look okay. With inexperienced readers, uh, don't, don't, look, don't look okay. Um, we have to work with this. This is the NCI, you know, the, the, one of the meccas of, of, of MRI, and clearly one looks at high users versus medium users. And again, just for PIRAS scoring, uh, the, the, the uh, concordance is not very good. For lesion detection, it is much better. Um, we're going to get to the bottom of this. I think there were many of us were at the PCF where Peter Choiki uh, chaired a session on, on AI and, and other ways to really uh, get down to the standardization issue, which I think we'll get to uh, over time. There's also some limited sensitivity issues, and again, these are, these are smaller cohorts of up to 250 patients at premier MRI centers. And when one looks at these, these reports, uh, at least a third of the progressions were detected by the systematic trusts, not by the MRI, really showing that we can't replace uh, um, uh, MRI, I mean, uh, replace biopsy with MRI with an MPV here at about 70%. We've looked at the 4K panel. Now, this is work from our, our past study, and again, uh, Ian and Peter and others are involved in this study, and these are the, the study sites down there listed at the below. Um, and we have, uh, and, and, and we, we collaborated here with Dan, Dan Soberg and Andrew Vickers and others, looking at the 4K panel for prediction of high-grade high prostate cancer in the canary cohort. I won't go through the whole thing. Won't, I definitely won't go through this whole entire slide, obviously. But we had a training and test very, uh, set. But the, the point of this slide was to show that, indeed, again, a point that was made by Peter on the panel, that prostate volume is clearly highly uh, predictive for a reclassification event, as is uh, ratio of total uh, cores at the time of diagnosis, and in this case, even PSA. And we went through the whole candidate predictors, and again, you can read the whole list that we did, and again, in collaboration with the memorial folks, uh, looking at uh, various measures that might be indicated with regards to uh, prediction of reclassification. And this is the final model, and it was, it was published in European Urology. Again, uh, we did find BMI, but also cores ratio, number of negative biopsies, prostate volume, and so forth. And then when we put it into a decision curve analysis, for the initial biopsy, the blue there is 4K score. The red there is PSA. For the initial biopsy, it does look like 4K score adds, but not in subsequent. We can get into why that might be later. So how do the guidelines, what do the guidelines say? Well, ASCO says that these ancillary tests are still unclear, under investigation, may be used then when clinical findings are discordant with pathologic findings. And then it does say that multiparametric MRI should not be used as a replacement for bi rebiopsy at this point. Again, I, I have hope, and I think many of us do, that it'll, it'll emerge as a very significant factor in active surveillance. We've also looked at the very simple clinical uh, uh, finding of negative biopsy. And again, others have reported this. I know that the UCSF group has reported this, but this is, this is unpublished work. It's tentatively accepted in European urology. Simply looking at the power of a negative biopsy. And this happens about 25, 30 percent of the time. A man is diagnosed with Gleason 6 disease, has his first biopsy, it's negative. There's no cancer. And what, what, the, what that really implies, and there's many men that have this. In fact, these up here are men that have had a negative biopsy or two negative biopsies. And you can, you can see here their risk of reclassification over the next five years is less than 5 percent. It's almost as if you don't have to do another biopsy for five years in these men that have repeat negative biopsies. We have many ongoing studies. I won't go through them. There's biomarkers that I know that, that Peter presented the first Oncotype one. We have one in Canary. We're working with Select MDX and then right across the street uh, with Mark Rubin for, for the P10 story and, and non-ETS fusions. Matt Cooperberg is leading our effort in PSA Kinetics. Mike Liss in San Antonio is, is uh, soon to report our MRI outcomes, is, uh, uh, um, submitted the abstracts to ASCO and to AUA. And then we have a really nice time-dependent modeling effort that I hope that we'll collaborate with researchers here and, and elsewhere on. We put out this first, so I'll end with some two, two or three slides of future directions. We did this first. I put this version 1.0, uh, kind of the, the ABC uh, risk calculator. And we took this, modeled this a little bit after uh, Ian's PCPT uh, calculator, which one can put in uh, various factors, age, PSA, months, and spipes, and it kind of spits out this uh, kind of uh, eye candy uh, appearance of who might have a progression and who might not, and show this to patients. I know many of you use this for uh, elevated PSA. But we're going to the next generation. The next generation 
has to be much more uh, refined. This is now out uh, uh, online. You can HBMI, PSA, prostate volume, and so forth. And uh, this is being worked up again by my fellow Jamie Kearns. Um, and the risk calculator will have an output like this. It's actually already uh, on this Shiny Apps uh, uh, website. You can uh, tweet this out if you want. This is the past risk calculator 2.0, and it shows where, where patients might be within uh, the cohort and then their uh, risk of upgrading at their next biopsy with a confidence interval and how they might uh, uh, compare to other similar people like them in their population. We also have a nice interface where you can drag the risk threshold where you want it and understand that clinical consequence. So how many uh, upgrades you might miss, how many great upgrades you would have, as well as how many biopsies you might save. In this situation, you would save almost a third of the biopsies and only miss 14 of the 162 upgrades, or 100 and, uh, 176 up upgrades. And also, of course, it will come with a, a requisite measures of accuracy, and I don't think anyone can argue with an NPV of 95% as being a, a very robust measure uh, and, and a very robust tool. We'll, of course, have a patient-centered uh, report. They, my, my people didn't like the smiley faces, and I, I said that let's work on it. This is in progress. But this is the theoretical 100 men, and again, one can see where uh, you might fall, a, a patient might see where he or might fall in, in this uh, uh, output. I have to thank the past team, of course. Uh, you can see here many, many uh, uh, memorial graduates, actually. Uh, there's Peter and, and Ian and Atreya Dash is at our VA, and uh, this has been a, a large amount of work uh, through a big team effort supported by the NIH and the DOD. So to end, just some take-home points. So the boundaries, and I think we can all agree, all, all very low-risk and low-risk patients. Um, the intermediate risk is controversial. Uh, I certainly think that low percent pattern four, perhaps those that had been on, on active surveillance for a while and then maybe have one biopsy pattern four, that, those are the ideal candidates. PSA less than 10, maybe, uh, as was suggested earlier today, a more intensive biopsy protocol, maybe in an older population as well. There could be exclusions. Uh, I, I clearly think that with a high tumor uh, volume on biopsy criteria, I, I certainly think that should give us pause. I think a small prostates or maybe high PSA density should also give us pause, as well as, of course, poor compliance. Thresholds, biennial biopsies seem to make sense after that first confirmatory biopsy, at least by our modeling. It really balances reducing the number of biopsies, yet not uh, missing any cancers. Um, of course, the endpoints are highly dependent on the boundaries that, you, that, that we place. Uh, no doubt the future directions are in, in the imaging and biomarker world. Uh, we're going to get there in imaging. I, I really firmly think, think that we will. And as was suggested earlier, we really have to have multinomial tools that add, bi add biomarkers or MRI on top uh, of already established clinical factors. And those clinical factors might be very easy, such as negative biopsies, volume of the prostate, and so forth. And again, I think we're going to await the biomarker studies, which hopefully will lend some insight uh, and improve the care of our patients. So thank you for your time. Thank you.